This episode of the Cyberwire is made possible in part by Barracuda. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your team to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications, and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now. Go to barracuda.com slash cyberwire. That's barracuda.com slash cyberwire. A second vulnerability is found and fixed in Log4j as both criminals and nation-state intelligence services increase their exploitation of Log4Shell. Iranian intelligence services have been actively conducting cyber espionage against a range of targets in the Middle East and Asia. Andrea Little Limbago from Interos checks in on supply chain issues. Our guest is Susie Greenberg from Intel with a look ahead toward the coming year. A quick look back at Patch Tuesday and finally some musings on literacy, orality and the way you pronounce stuff people tweet about. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, December 15th, 2021. We open, as we have all week, with updates on the vulnerabilities found in Apache's Log4j. And today, it is indeed vulnerabilities, plural, because a second vulnerability has been discovered. Unlike its log-for-shell cousin, it hasn't, as we go to press, received a catchy nickname yet, but MITRE has registered the issue as CVE 2021-45046. MITRE says, quote, It was found that the fix to address CVE 2021-44228 in Apache Log4j 2.15.0 was incomplete in certain non-default configurations. This could allow attackers with control over thread context map MDC input data when the logging configuration uses a non-default pattern layout with either a context lookup or a thread context map pattern to craft malicious input data using a JNDI lookup pattern resulting in a denial-of-service attack, end quote. In any case, the flaw is now patched, and organizations should apply that patch, or, if they're using older versions of Log4j, they should disable JNDI functionality. That's, in any case, the default in the newer patched versions. Late yesterday afternoon and running into the early evening, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency held a phone conference with the media to discuss the current state of risk and remediation surrounding Log4Shell. CyberScoop quotes CISA's Executive Assistant Director Eric Goldstein to the effect that, quote, Certainly, given the nature of this vulnerability, the triviality of exploitation, the ubiquity of the presence across enterprise, consumer, and IoT products, Really, our broad focus here is driving mitigation across the board, recognizing that malicious cyber actors of all types may decide to use this vulnerability to achieve a variety of attack types or drive a variety of malicious ends. End quote. In some respects, Goldstein offered reassurances that exploitation had so far been not as consequential as it might have been, but that this was no grounds for complacency. ABC News quotes him as saying, At this point in time, we are not seeing widespread, highly sophisticated, damaging intrusion campaigns, but certainly we are deeply concerned about the prospects of adversaries using this vulnerability to cause real harm and even impacting national critical functions, which is why we have such a sense of urgency at CISA and across the cybersecurity community to drive urgent mitigation and adoption of controls wherever we can." On balance, however, as Reuters reports, CISA thinks most of the activity has been scanning and cryptojacking and that it hasn't confirmed industry reports of more damaging activity. Those industry reports are warning of both nation-state activity 
and more sophisticated moves from cyber gangland, we've seen, as the record notes, that log for shell has been exploited to distribute ransomware. It's also now being used by nation-state espionage services. Microsoft reported yesterday that it's seeing, quote, the CVE 2021-44-228 vulnerability being used by multiple tracked nation-state activity groups originating from China, Iran, North Korea, and Turkey. This activity ranges from experimentation during development, integration of the vulnerability to in-the-wild payload deployment, and exploitation against targets to achieve the actor's objectives. End quote. Microsoft particularly draws attention to Iran's phosphorus and China's hafnium groups as among the nation-state actors that have been using log for shell against their targets. Security Week reports that Mandiant has also seen Iranian and Chinese exploitation in progress. Mandiant thinks more intelligence services will be joining the party soon. The company's vice president of intelligence analysis, John Holquist, emailed Security Week to tell them, quote, We have seen Chinese and Iranian state actors leveraging this vulnerability, and we anticipate other state actors are doing so as well or preparing to. We believe these actors will work quickly to create footholds in desirable networks for follow-on activity, which may last for some time. In some cases, they will work from a wish list of targets that existed long before this vulnerability was public knowledge. In other cases, desirable targets may be selected after broad targeting. End quote. The criminal-to-criminal market has also taken note, and Microsoft has seen access brokers working to monetize the vulnerability. Quote, Mystic and the Microsoft 365 Defender team have confirmed that multiple tracked activity groups acting as access brokers have begun using the vulnerability to gain initial access to targeted networks. These access brokers then sell access to these networks to ransomware-as-a-service affiliates. We have observed these groups attempting exploitation on both Linux and Windows systems, which may lead to an increase in human-operated ransomware impact on both of these operating system platforms. The basic advice about handling the vulnerability has remained stable. Both ESET and Fastly, to take two of the many security firms who've published recommendations, emphasize the importance of determining where the log-for-shell vulnerability exists in an organization and of then applying the available patches. Bleeping Computer is offering a list of affected products along with vendor advice on mitigation, and Security Week is maintaining a current list of tools and resources for defenders. Spare a thought, gentle listener, for the Apache volunteers working their end of this problem. The Apache Software Foundation is, the Wall Street Journal reminds us, a U.S. 501c3 not-for-profit outfit and dependent on its volunteers. Their work is invaluable. Self-described cybersecurity plebe and double pulsar editor Kevin Beaumont, who tweets under the handle Gossy the Dog, has been following the Log for Shell incident with bemused interest. He summed things up yesterday with an askance look at some of the freewheeling history of open source development. Quote, Basically, the perfect ending to cybersecurity in 2021 is a 90s-style Java Vuln in an open-source module written by two volunteers with no funding, used by large cybersecurity vendors, undetected until Minecraft chat got pwned, where nobody knows how to respond properly. End quote. Nicely woofed and good doggy, Gossy the dog. An apparent Iranian government threat actor which Symantec tentatively associates with the organization known variously as Seedworm or Muddy Water has been active against targets in Israel, Jordan, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Pakistan, Thailand, and Laos. The cyber espionage campaign has concentrated on telecommunications and IT service providers. The attacks do not appear to use bespoke malware, but instead rely on legitimate tools and commodity malware. Once inside the targets, the operators live off the land, making use of the victim's own infrastructure and steal credentials to pivot across networks of interest to them. IBM independently has identified a novel attack vector in use by Iranian state actors, and that vector is Slack. The group IBM tracks as TG17 and others call Muddy Water 
employed free workspaces in the legitimate and widely used business chat tool in an attempt to compromise an unnamed Asian airline. IBM wrote, quote, Dubbed A-Clip, this new backdoor conducts C2 utilizing Slack's APIs to create an actor-controlled Slack workspace and channels where the adversary could receive system information, including requested files and screenshots, post commands to the backdoor, and receive commands in return. End quote. It's not clear yet what data, if any, Muddy Water removed through the backdoor, but it's at least possible some information about reservations was obtained. Slack has shut down the malicious workspaces and reassures users that their services as a whole have not been compromised. Lest you find yourself inclined to be too hard on Tehran, Tehran would like you to know that, hey, it's the victim here, really. Iran's ambassador to the United Nations complained that the Islamic Republic is more sinned against than sinning since it's well-behaved in cyberspace and because of the way it's subjected to constant cyber harassment by Israel and the U.S. He called for more development of international norms for cyberspace. The Zero Day Initiative offers a rundown of fixes Adobe, Apache, Apple, Google, and Microsoft issued yesterday on Patch Tuesday. Some of Microsoft's fixes addresses a zero day that's been used in the resurgent Emotet campaigns. Also yesterday, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency released three industrial control system advisories. And finally, our social media desk tells us there's a hot debate among InfoSec practitioners on the one true pronunciation of the library at the root of the Log4Shell vulnerability, with some saying it's Log4J and others proclaiming, no, FYI, it's actually Logforge. Thank you very much. Not since GIF versus JIF have we seen such passion over a label But that's what you get when a post-literate culture like ours abandons the oral formulaic tradition and names stuff as if it's to be read silently instead of spoken aloud. The greatest generation got this. Everyone knew how to pronounce Kilroy was here, and the acronyms all made sense, like snafu. We'll add that perhaps as an industry we would do well to stop naming things like their track titles from a 1980s album from Prince— That new vulnerability in Log4J, by the way, doesn't yet have a snazzy name, so hop to it, InfoSec World, and share your thoughts. And you can take that from me, because I'm giving it to you straight here. I'm the artist formerly known as Dave. And now, a word from our sponsor, Verizon. Mitigate the risks and realize the benefits of digital transformation with the help of Verizon, a leader in cybersecurity managed and professional services for nearly two decades. From secure cloud computing solutions to advanced detection and response capabilities, Verizon helps secure data, networks, and infrastructure of many of the world's best-known organizations. Their annual Data Breach Investigations Report is considered the gold standard of cybercrime research, And Verizon's leadership in network, wireless, and IoT connectivity makes it uniquely capable of protecting the ever-expanding attack surface. Let Verizon help you optimize your defenses and achieve the maximum return on your security investments. Learn more at verizonenterprise.com slash products slash security. Susie Greenberg is Vice President of Communications and Incident Response at Intel. As we approach the end of 2021, I spoke with her to gather her insights on the year we've had, what's yet to come, and how to ensure everyone has an opportunity to contribute. It's been an exciting year, to say the least. I think we've really seen uh, an expanded attack surface, especially for our adversaries to capitalize on. And, you know, we have a number of things that we can thank for that. There's been technology advancements, for one. Uh, Others include a more complex and growing supply chain. And then we're seeing this shift from what, you know, was the new normal to just now it's just reality of uh, full-time remote and and hybrid work that we really need to take into consideration. And that really is going to impact 
all of the areas of security that we're seeing. So that's everything from firmware and, and hardware security to supply chain, and then and really that importance on uh, transparency as well. You know, when, when I think of Intel, I, I certainly uh, think about hardware innovation, uh, literally dozens of devices that uh, use the chips that you all manufacture. What is on the roadmap there in terms of um, innovation and the types of things we might expect to see from a security point of view going forward? One of the things that we've seen is that organizations, it's really basic in terms of what we need to be doing, and that's um, being more proactive versus reactive in the way that we're responding to threats. Typically today, the way organizations are, they're more reactive in the way that they're responding what we're seeing is that there's a shift more to that that proactive side and that it's important to be uh, identifying these vulnerabilities and um, that requires a significant investment. And so businesses are really looking at the way that they increase their engagements and partnerships with external researchers in um, developing you know, more coordinated vulnerability disclosure and, and bug bounty programs that... Um, really kind of uh, get to the root of some of these issues and facilitate a better collaboration between companies and external researchers to uh, stay ahead of these threats and and help avoid zero days wherever possible. You know, I I know something that you're very active in is uh, working on improving the situation when it comes to diversity uh, in cybersecurity, specifically um, more opportunities for women. And I'm curious, you know, where do you think we find ourselves there? Have we seen improvements this year and what work is yet to be done? I don't know how much improvement we've seen this last year. I think, in fact, we've probably seen in the industry as a whole a a drop off in the number of women that are, are working at all. They've had to make some really tough choices in the last year about what they're able to do when it comes to working and then also supporting their families. I have three young kids and, you know, I'm very fortunate that I didn't have to make those decisions, but I'm, I'm not the norm. And, you know, there was a recent study that came out from the, the Aspen Institute and it found that only 20%, 24% of cybersecurity workers self-identify as women. And so, you know, while we're seeing a, a greater awareness around the need for diversity and security today, there's really no question that the gender gap in cybersecurity remains an industry-wide problem. And, you know, I do feel really passionate about this because I think employees and, and individuals feel some sort of security in, no pun intended, and safety in numbers. And, um, you know, we really need to be fostering an environment that gives women more opportunities to thrive um, in environments that are friendly towards all different types of people and perspectives. And so, you know, I think we have a significant way to go in this area and um, we're seeing a, a still a, a pretty major gap and, and that's going to negatively impact the, the overall workforce and, and diversity as well. So bringing awareness, I think, is the first step and talking about it, which is something I don't think we typically have done in the past. And, and then how do we support and give those platforms to women to feel like they can come into this type of field and feel supported and, and feel uh, recognized for their contributions in a, a very male-dominated environment. That's Susie Greenberg from Intel. And now, a word from our sponsor, Insights, a Rapid7 company. Threat intelligence can benefit all organizations by proactively defending against threats before they become cyber attacks. Insights, now a member of the Rapid7 family, is offering a free, personalized company threat intelligence report to help you manage the risk in today's cybersecurity landscape. Within minutes and using only your company's domain, Insights' proprietary tools find potential external threats, including phishing attacks and dark web mentions targeting your organization. To download your free threat intelligence report, go to insights.com slash cyberwire. Insights allows any security operations team, regardless of size or capability maturity, to expand identification, speed remediation, and automate threat mitigation across its extended attack surface. 
Again, that's insights.com slash cyberwire to download your company's free threat report. And we thank Insights, a Rapid7 company, for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Andrea Little Limbago. She is Vice President of Research and Analysis at Enteros. Andrea, it's always great to have you back. Um, you know, we have seen lots of headlines about supply chain issues, uh, both, of course, in the cybersecurity realm, but then just globally in general. Those things are, of course, linked. And I'm curious for, for your take on this, of kind of where things stand and how you think it's going to shake out. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. And this is an important area that I think we've risen to prominence, you know, as from the beginning of COVID and with solar winds. And I think it is just going to be an area that will dominate discussions going into 2022. And there are those mm. two different angles that are, though, really just almost increasingly intertwined. You almost can't separate them. One is the, the notion of the supply chain attacks, and that's like your solar winds uh, exchange, because say uh, Code Cove, <laughs> Excelion, kind of the list kind of mm-hmm. keeps going mm-hmm. on and on that we saw over, over the last year. And that's where there is the manip- manipulation of the software or malicious code embedded within it as part of updates and so forth. There are many different ways that the supply chain hardware and software can get manipulated. And that's one component of it. And that we really have seen to be on the rise and is, you know, is a troubling trend. Uh, we are seeing some legislation in the U.S. to help secure some aspects of that. And um, I think the movement toward the, the software bill of material, the SBOM, uh, which we hear a lot about, um, I think we're gonna just continue hearing a lot about, more about that. And that really requires companies to, to know where the various code comes from, basically having transparency for you know, the various libraries and software and so forth that are within their ecosystem. And I think that's a big shift where many companies don't necessarily know that. And so I think there'll be some requirements that will continue to come along. At the same time, we're seeing all the supply chain disruptions. And those mm-hmm. are also tightly linked because some of them are and have been disrupted by ransomware, really disrupting some right. of the supply chain. So there's supply chain issues as far as some of the supply and demand and the just-in-time and some of the disruptions due to concentration risks. But there are also the disruptions that are occurring because of ransomware and other kinds of uh, cyber attacks that are occurring on the energy sector, which we see in Colonial Pipeline, for instance, the transportation sector, logistics. An interesting way where I'm seeing right now where there, that intersection, China's new data privacy law, basically has large requirements on data transfer outside of China. And so where that's impacting right now is the shipping data that's the, that we're seeing mm-hmm. where the companies that normally, you know, that, that track global shipping to help assess for congestion and so forth and bottlenecks in the, in the shipping lanes, they're now missing a lot of that Chinese data. It's basically has gone blank based oh. on the data privacy regulations of not sharing that data externally. And so that's a you know, relatively new occurrence that's going on. The, the, the data privacy law came into effect uh, in early November, but it's already having an impact there for those companies that track basically maritime tracking metrics, uh, mm-hmm. are seeing basically a huge data gap now. And so it's just an interesting sort of confluence of how all this is just so interdependent with each other and has these externalities that in many ways are just unanticipated. You know, it's easy to, to Monday morning quarterback this stuff. And, and I, I think um, for me, you know, it seems as though we, we chipped away at, at uh, the supply chain in terms of having things be more and more just in time and where can we save money, where can we save money, where can we save money, and we're kind of paying for that now. We're paying for that in that there was very little uh, room for excess, you know, room, excess uh, capacity. Do you think we're going to see an em- a global emphasis on getting some of that capacity back? Is this a lesson learned? Um, I think I think the companies that are going to have a competitive advantage going forward are taking this as a lesson learned. And what I've seen, mm-hmm. you know, it varies across industries. It varies even if within even within some companies. You know, there are debates going on exactly about that right now. But sort of the, the biggest, you know, sort of um, you know, bumper sticker that summarizes what where some companies are heading is you know, from just in time to just in case. And so, ah. basically, making sure that they're switching that paradigm so that they have that some sort of capacity. So just in case. You know, a big climate, weather, severe weather event happens just in case a ransomware mm-hmm. attack happens, just in case, uh, you know, a, a global pandemic requires lockdowns. I mean, and it's really that broad range, right? I mean, it could even be you know, just in case my, your, your key supplier goes bankrupt, um, just in case you have a key supplier that all of a sudden is connected to human rights violations it's, or is linked to, you know, technology that supports a, a foreign military. I mean, it's really 
the just in case really isn't just just in case for having capacity in the storage, it's just in case for all this, these whole range of events that can disrupt supply chains. I think it will become a competitive advantage for the, so for those companies that are thinking that way and are adjusting and making those investments now, I think that will pay off. For those that don't or are kind of still wanting to retreat back to the old ways, I think are going to pay the price down the road. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. Well, Andrea Little Limbago, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the Cyberwire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Inky. Catch fish before they breach your network with Inky's innovative technology that integrates with existing security. See how at Inky.com. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Haru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a message from our sponsor, Cyber Reason. They're coming for it, your personal data, your intellectual property, your business. Cyber attackers are working to take what belongs to you and holding you to ransom. At Cyber Reason, they work hard to ensure that defenders like you don't have to fear ransomware. You will end it. Cyber Reason's anti-ransomware is the most effective and focused protection on the market today. We're talking about multiple layers of machine learning, behavioral-based detection, artificial intelligence, threat analysis, and more. This is why Cyber Reason can stop any ransomware strain, even those never before seen. It's not just a product, it's a mission. Cyber Reason was created to reverse the attacker's advantage and give you the upper hand against ransomware and all other cyber attacks. This is a promise Cyber Reason backs with their leading security platform and a $1 million breach warranty. With Cyber Reason, you won't fear ransomware, you'll end it. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash ransom. And we thank Cyber Reason for sponsoring our show.